Something I find my mind drifting to fairly often, especially as I stare at the low points of this channel right in the face, is how fleeting success can be. There's athletes who peaked in college or never even made it past their local teams and have to leave their passion behind forever. The artists of One Hit Wonders whose names will only be known with an oh yeah, those ones, and who will never be able to perform their passion at the same level ever again. Leaders of fan communities of works that get cancelled and slowly die out until everything they worked for no longer exists. There's bands who break up, actors that break down, and creations that simply break. At any moment, our greatest success is already behind us, and we have no idea when the next one will come. When I see the dips of my channel, I can't help but think I guess I'll always just be that edge runners person, as even Black Lagoon, my first great success, doesn't do very well anymore. But I don't need to take up your time complaining about the fact that I have a platform to speak to and influence so many people and spread love for my hobbies. I guess it's simply my desire to be like the characters who I love to profile here so much, the well-intentioned villains of anime. When I envision my slice of success, it looks so much like them. An ironic fact, given they actually speak to the myth of success itself. You know and probably love these characters. Most obviously, they fill a specific niche of attraction. Somewhere between traditional dark heartthrob and Tumblr sexy man, they're ambiguous entities capable of taking a spot in fantasy for almost anyone. They're either the softest little sub, the most ferocious dom, or anything in the middle, depending on what you want. They're hyper-intelligent most times, sparking years-long debates about who among them would come out on top as we overanalyze the thriller plot beats which prove their worth. But no plan is hatched alone, so they're endlessly charismatic, not just manipulating foes but friends alike, convincing anyone and everyone to fall under the banner of their ideals through personal appeals, romance, friendship, blackmail, really anything. But who wouldn't give them their undivided attention? After all, they're unique in worlds often emphasized for negative qualities, sharply contrasted against bland or boring fellow citizens as someone to be looked up to. Think of how many shots of these characters have you physically looking up at them. Their unique nature is fairly often helped along by some kind of special power as well, really selling how chosen they are. They're meant to change this world. Whether it's birthright, dark secret plans masquerading as pure chance, or the result of past events, they have some advantage which allows them the platform to become the agent of their ideals. Often young and pretty, they have all the time in the world to see change, and yet they push for it right now. These characters are perfect. If you've been around here for a while, they're probably not just what you want, but everything you want to be. But I would argue that all of these factors are not why we love them, but simply how the true reason we love them is expressed based on the standards around us which influence media. To me, these characters are an odd form of representation. It's not about seeing characters who look like me, but really ones who think like me. Now don't misconstrue this point, physical representation is exceptionally important and a larger and more pressing issue than the one I'm covering right now. I have my own non-normalities, so I understand the struggles of none of these characters are like me, which probably then just feeds my relation to these villains as characters I do relate to. They share with me something which has driven everything you have ever seen of me here, the desire for something not offered. Now we'll be getting into specifics of some of these characters to display this, so as always the chapters feature can help you avoid spoilers, but there will be some all the way throughout. Also, these characters are not strictly the villains of their stories, but lie somewhere in the gray area of protagonists, so I'm considering them all under the term villain here. First off, we have Code Geass and Lush V. Britannia, the exiled prince from the family which rules over most of the world. In an alternate time where Britain's conquest never ended, ruthless military might controls a majority of the globe and is constantly expanding, like to Japan, the holdout nation Lelouch and his chronically injured sister Nunnally are sent to as bargaining chips. The Britons here live well once the conquest is over, attending high-class schools while once bustling districts like Shinjuku are referred to as ghettos before they're massacred to keep dark secrets safe. Witnessing the duality present in the kindness of his disadvantaged sister and the cruelty of the world at large which injured her, Lelouch swears to do whatever it takes to create a kinder world for Nunnally, one which can arrive within her lifetime. 
He is selfish and physical in his goals. He'll sacrifice any number of nobodies if it means the fall of Britannia, and his sister comes before any of the goals benefits to others. But at the core of his wishes and actions is an abstract desire, that being kindness. He doesn't wish for money or fame as he literally hides behind a mask, not to be number one or to be remembered as he allows his name to go down in history as pure evil, but simply for people to care more about others, something which can't be measured or compared. No one hands out kindness on the street, and it's something which relies on the individual as it isn't given monetary benefits. He desires something not offered, something outside the traditional bounds of success. And of course, I could never resist bringing up Shogo Makashima, the main antagonist of Psychopaths. Set in future Japan, their world is one without choice, as a supercomputer named Sybil determines both people's aptitudes as well as their intent, which means crimes can be prevented before they can even occur. One of the few remaining stable nations on Earth in 2112, Sybil is absolutely accepted by the majority of citizens who go through life without stress, even to the point of not functioning due to a lack of it. However, this predetermination is seen as the robbery of free will by some, including Makashima, who provides the means for minor antagonists to poke and prod at the system as he waits to determine if it should be entirely abolished. He settles on believing it should be because he tests those raised under it and finds disgust at their lack of originality and thus free will. Even when presented with the loss of things they love dear, they find themselves unable to make a decision which is not ordained from above, like he so often does. As such, he feels alone, struggling desperately to find connection in a world full of constant disappointments. He harshly discards the minor antagonists because none of them live up to what he wants from partners. Once again, he has selfishness in his motivations. Part of his reasoning to abolish Sybil even though it will likely lead to the collapse of society, is because he can relate to no one under it, and as such, he lacks these simple pleasures which make life worthwhile for so many, like simple conversations, connections, or even love. But he makes this judgment on the abstract concept of free will, something not offered almost by definition from Sybil. Under it, he can never live a life which feels worthwhile, even though what he desires is so common. Now, one I could have started with for popularity's sake is Light Yagami, but he has to come after the others with a hefty warning that I don't relate to this man, he's a privileged idiot who deserved to fail, but he likely needs no introduction, but just in case, he's the protagonist of Death Note, a world where notebooks carried by God of Death can kill those whose names are written in them. Light, a standout student considered the smartest, most athletic, most driven in the country, is disillusioned with the world around him mostly drifting through life due to his hatred of crime, often stating how rotten the world is. So, when he acquires a death note by chance, he begins to write the names of criminals in it, leaving just enough of a trail that it is clear one person is somehow judging the wicked, hoping that a coat of fear will remove crime from the world entirely, as everyone who thinks about committing one realizes they would be killed as well. What he wants is technically justice, but this concept is shown to be exceptionally abstract through his rivalry with both L and his police chief father, who bring their own ideals to the table. While Light is a chronic megalomaniac focused on becoming godlike, he eschews the normal motivations of pure power for such things, and instead focuses on that concept of justice, however skewed. He resorts to the Death Note because what he wants, a peaceful world, is something which has never been offered in most of human history, even to the privileged like him. Now, we're getting pretty lengthy here, so I'll briefly mention a few others for validity's sake, although we'll focus on those three first ones since I've expanded upon them here. There's, of course, Isaiah from Dorarara, who seeks chaos for selfish reasons, but wants what cannot be had in an interesting way. He doesn't really care what his life is, he simply wants it to last forever, as he witnesses humans in amazement. Moriarty from Moriarty the Patriot, a retelling of some of the Sherlock Holmes stories, wants systematic change, allowing regular citizens the means to exact revenge on the upper classes and hoping to unite both through his final plan. His concept not allowed is equality. And Vanitas from the case study of Vanitas, the perfectly horny vampire anime we talked about before. A bit of a wild card, he's a human who hates vampires and so he seeks to cure them all as his revenge. 
Deep down, he's desiring love with what little life he has remaining in a cutthroat world. Now, we've said the phrase not allowed many times in regards to these concepts they base their personal success around. And key to understanding why is looking at these situations they give up to chase their personal goals and then how easy those goals should be in comparison. Lelouch is a privileged Briton in Japan, the best student at the top academy and assuring for a comfortable life until the end of his days. His Gios power is the ability to command anyone once through eye contact, which only makes this more poignant. He could easily have anything material or any life he wanted in the physical sense. Yet he gives all that up to chase down a success that feels true to his desires and what he wants for those around him. Makashima is criminally asymptomatic, akin to a psychopath, someone who can commit crimes without an emotional response and as such cannot be detected by Sybil. Since justice in this world relies entirely on prevention, he has free reign to do anything he pleases. His resources are obviously plentiful, so he could live out his days with his own free will, but he only finds value in when others have it as well. Light, as we covered in depth before, is a privileged character with a police chief father fond over by all and sure to live any life he wanted materially. He is the picture of success in his very society. But like our others, he decided on something which felt personally more rewarding, even though that task was one of constant and consistent effort against the world's greatest minds. Isaiah, Moriarty, and Venetas are all similarly comfortable in life and physically could have nothing to wish for, and again similarly, they all expend effort in search of something else to different extents, but true for all of them nonetheless. So this is where we have to begin to question success. These characters all start from a traditionally successful position, yet none of them are satisfied with it. Comparably, the goals they lead harsh lives for seem quite mundane. There's kindness, connection, justice, equality. These are things which are much more possible than physical success. Think about how much is required for lavish physical goals compared to personal ones. For kids to attend a fancy academy, a lot of time, money, and energy needs to be expended from construction to staffing to advertising and so much more. But for people to be kind, you simply have to do so. That is, unless the world around them makes being so disadvantageous. And that's the key. Their true desires are much more human and much more simple than the physical success they know. If Lelouch was willing to sacrifice his privilege, Makashima, his advantage, light, his comfortability, all for such simple things, why do they have to fight such harsh battles? Did they not exchange something of their own for what they desired except a lower life for something less productive? Why was the resistance so staunch? Because of the myth of success. It's most beneficial for those who attained physical success long ago to shape that as the standard and present that we should all wish for material gain because most of our material gain is actually theirs. I'm here to convince you that you too relate to these villains whether it's recognized or not. That abstract personal goals found through self-knowledge will always be more satisfying than what we've learned to want from others. If you want the best house and the fastest car, why? Is it specifically for those things or because of the satisfaction of showing off, the thrills which contrast against boring life? If you want to go out and party, why? Because of the people you meet to find physical pleasure from them? If you want to chase your hobbies, why? Because of the pleasures of art, the people you do them with, the care that goes into them? Doesn't every material goal have a personal reason and as such, we could simply find that reason instead if society allowed it? All of these things require money, which means a successful life, but the things we call success are never actually the end goal. What we all truly desire has been pushed to the side and material gain put in its place as if it's the only way to achieve it because certain people have a very, very vested interest in doing so. And so, fittingly, one trait most of these kinds of characters also share is their eventual failure. Lelouch accomplishes his goal, but he dies to do it. Makashima finds connection, but only in the man who kills him, and his overall plan fails. Light is killed by Ryuk, who was always in control, but just letting the show play out to be entertained. 
We'll return to light later though, as the Lelouch and Makashima are the most fitting here. Each dies with a smile on their face. They did find personal success, but they had to die to do so. That's how against these common pleasures their worlds were, kindness and connection. The second they received them, they had to die. There was no way to enjoy it personally aside from those few moments. They gave up success for genuine satisfaction and perished for it. Success is a myth because what's called success offers no satisfaction and what's really success is not allowed. You may think it's silly to say all this based around some animated series or even stories at all, but I'd direct you to the collective trauma of entire generations. It's not normal for the consistent joke of a worldwide collection of peers to be, oh goddamn, I just really want to die, haha. <laughs> it's born from kids going into debt just to be allowed the privilege of not making enough money to live off of even without considering their debt. It's artists mocked as unrealistic and suffering because they want to express themselves and their emotions, but that doesn't make someone money. And everyone wakes up every day to do something that gives them no pleasure because if they don't, we've been told they deserve nothing. How is life itself the most basic thing which comes before anything else not a protected right? If it was, think about how successful we could be, how much kinder we could be to strangers wanting to say hello if we were not taxed with the burden of constantly being late for something we needed to do to survive. How much more connection would there be if we were not all exhausted constantly? How much more accepting would we be if we treated actual success as such and not this bastardization of wealth which we've come to know it as? Personal success is not profitable, so it is not allowed. I bring up these characters in relation to all of this because I think they're much more realistic depictions of success than what we actually see because of how they suffer for their goals despite privilege. And those advantages they have are important to cover as well because that then speaks to how they achieved what's called success in the first place, not just why it's a myth. The only reason our villains were able to chase their personal goals is because they started near the top. We already covered how for each, and you may simply say that it is the convenience of the plot, that complex plot twists of these thrillers, and you need to have characters who can pull anything from anywhere. But in reality, it's just a depiction of how the world is. Almost no one is successful down to will and effort alone, and even if they are successful, they're usually not satisfied with what we call success for its own sake. It's likely cliche at this point, but I want to look at one of the supposedly most successful people in the world to show this because so much of how they're presented is a lie. So let's go well off the rails and just start talking about real world stuff instead of anime with everyone's favorite person ever, Elon Musk. Here's what you've probably heard about him. He's the great innovator of Tesla and SpaceX who worked his way to all of his goals. He started programming from a young age, even selling a basic base video game called Blaster to a computing magazine at the age of 12. As a young adult getting through college, he worked odd jobs like on a farm or at a lumber mill as any other college student supporting himself. And he dropped out of his master's program after just two days to start his own business, coding and creating Zip2 and Internet City Guide, a more original concept for the late 90s, spending long nights ensuring it was just everything he wanted. All of this is true, or at least based on truth. But he isn't a founder of Tesla, a lawsuit simply designated him as one later on. Yes, he did engage in productive pursuits as a child and worked hard nights towards his goal as a young adult, but his success comes from the fact that he was born into prior success. His father Errol was part owner of an emerald mine, once even bragging, we had so much money we couldn't even close our safe. Musk's self-made business Zip2 was funded by his father's money, the thing which allowed him to safely drop out of his program and start a business on a whim. He wasn't creating it while working full time to survive, he had his survival guaranteed and through that was able to work on it. 
Plus, Zip2 was sold during the dot-com bubble of the late 90s, the period where rapid internet adoption spiked prices for websites through the roof. Investors looking to get richer quicker spent outrageous sums on domains and services, hoping their value would only keep increasing, helped along by legislation which was very pro-investor at the time. It was speculation. Without his father's money and either a few years earlier or a few years later, he would have never been able to sell Zip2 for $22 million. And that sum brings up an interesting point. Think about how much you could do for $22 million. You'd probably live off of that for the rest of your life, right? Well, obviously, he could have done the same, living lavishly on that sum, and yet he still kept going. It's almost like material possessions and money can never truly satisfy us, and constantly chasing and rewarding them is a self-feeding beast that creates billionaire monsters whose large sums are just them trying to make up for their own deficits. And that's true because Alon is a man with many of those deficits. Once he sold Zip2, he was free to stick his fingers into a lot of pies, including space travel, earthly transportation, neurotechnology, and even more. But in the space industry, he was seen as a novice anytime his money provided him an in with other companies. His big, boring company projects have been cancelled and are widely mocked as essentially a worse, more efficient, more classist version of rail lines. And the Neuralink researchers were reportedly upset with Musk being listed as the sole author of a 29 paper containing their research, very heavily supporting the idea that Musk himself isn't really the genius engineer he purports to be but instead co-ops the work of people he hires. He's been ousted as the CEO of his own companies multiple times. SpaceX almost went bankrupt after a lot of failures because one success netted them a massive NASA contract. And of course, there's Twitter, the entire situation where he lost more money in a shorter time than anyone else after months of reneging on his word and doubling back to have to be sued to buy a company. Because of his fortune, he's able to sink ridiculous sums of money into any stupid idea or reinvent worse versions to already solve problems, and whether it succeeds or not doesn't actually matter. What we see is a man who at points in his life has worked hard and made some maneuvers to place himself in a good position, but it was all only possible because of his father's influence and was disconnected by his own sums gained through the work being in the right place at the right time to succeed. His efforts were able to be rewarded due to parental success and luck, something most people will never experience to the same amount, even if they give the same amount of effort. We can see something similar with all of the top 10 wealthiest individuals. Bernard Arnault, owner of LVMH, which is Moa Tennessee Louis Vuitton, which I'm sorry, I've probably butchered, but it is a luxury conglomerate. Now, he graduated with an engineering degree and worked as one for some time at his father's company, which he was able to take over because of that lineage. Jeff Bezos' story is told as him being the child of a 17-year-old mother who still needed to finish high school, and he worked at McDonald's to support himself while he earned a 4.2 GPA in college, eventually leaving the jobs he was offered from all that hard work to start Amazon. But do they mention how Amazon started with a $300,000 investment from his parents after he worked at a hedge fund? Bill Gates was a small for his age kid, bullied for that fact, and so he turned his time into productive pursuits like programming, and he eventually scored 1590 out of 1600 on his SATs, clearly intelligent, however he dropped out of college to go on his own way and start a computing business. A move that clearly paid off, but quite the risky one, right? It was possible because his parents said they'd support him if he dropped out, which allowed him to actively lie to companies about software he developed as he would only start developing it once they expressed an interest in it, meaning none of his work went to waste. Warren Buffett had a congressman father. Larry Ellison was not from a rich family and put in his due, but got the luck of the draw to pay off that work with a government contract. Larry Page had a supportive wealthy family to allow him the time and energy to tinker. Steve Ballmer was just a friend of Bill Gates who brought him on, and Carlos Slim was purchasing stocks at the age of 12 after his father gave him a head start on those matters. These are the top 10 richest individuals in the world. It's not that they never worked hard, but it's just that they were able to take risks and their work from those risks was able to be seen and rewarded in a way most never will. It's much easier to crunch out a program you were supposed to already have done when you're not working full time during the day and your parents will support you going back to school anytime if you fail. 
It's easier to develop a website for long hours when it's not your money being used to do so. For every tech startup millionaire celebrated, 100 single parents and first generation students and prosperous former refugees should be celebrated even harder. The key is not the hard work needed to succeed as so many of us put in these same kind of efforts and are never rewarded, but it is rather the ability to afford failure. If you're from a poor or even working class family living paycheck to paycheck, dropping out of college to chase your dreams is a risk that could land you in debt for the rest of your life, and so you continue down the path. Leaving your job spur of the moment isn't an option when you need every single paycheck just to stay afloat. And who has time to code a website with hungry children and no support? But when your parents, even if begrudgingly, could pay off your debt, you're free to do so. When you can always go back to the garage, you're free to do so. Many of these wealthy individuals actually have more failures under their belt than you and me because they have the time, energy, and resources to fail and still be okay. There's no such thing as success. There's only the luck to be able to fail. We can see this on a lower level too, that success still comes down to the whims of prior successes of others. Hard work is not really about creating success, but putting yourself in the space that gives you the greatest portion of luck to be seen. Every talent that's ever been discovered was in the right place for someone influential to recognize their abilities or kept pushing and pushing and pushing to different people in that position until one of them decided to give them the time of day. YouTubers succeed and fail based on the whims of an algorithm you can play to but can't predict enough to guarantee anything and anyone who says they can already has the resources to test how to and it was just guesswork. Most people I know with a good job got it through connections and I've seen plenty of people who didn't work a day in college have high paying jobs now. What if you graduated into a recession or in the wrong place for your field at the wrong time or a sick family member needed you right then and so your degree becomes out of date? So much of life is guesswork that can't be helped. And this all has another level to it when we look at what life is like for those who do manage to claw success with hard work alone. When we see good jobs for people like that, it usually just means an exceptionally draining and overwhelming experience that you need to survive. Sure, you'll be making more money, but can you even enjoy it with no free time or when you have it, no energy to utilize it? Maybe you trade your body now through physical labor for a better future, but will that future be worthwhile if you're too exhausted, and sometimes even worse, to partake in it? And what about people who started there even? These successes we're talking about are only if you fit the mold which allows such things. What about people who can't function well in traditional workspaces? What about people with chronic pain or illness? What about every marginalized person who has to work somewhere lower paying just to be accepted and get a job in the first place? The further and further you get from the mold, the less and less luck one has with success. The simple idea of success isn't even possible for some. why we love villains and why you should too because they are a little slice of what this world has never offered they are the people who will throw false success to the wind to chase a personal version they are the ones who give us hope because they mean that some author somewhere feels the same as us and the love of their work means we are not alone with our peers why do many of us want a villain arc is it because we've realized we don't fit the mold and so we can never be successful? Or that even if we do what it offers, it's just a bastardized image of value that only appeals to the wicked? I have to return to the idea of it never being enough for the rich. Even with massive amounts of wealth, enough to feed the world over and still be comfortable, they still push for more. They still abuse workers, they still crush unions, they still refuse to pay taxes, they're still awful, broken people desperately trying to feel whole through wealth. Even the so-called good ones who give large sums to charity, well, maybe the reason we need charity in the first place is because they took all the money. If they just let it go where it should have in the first place, they wouldn't need to give it away. They're idiots just like us, making awful decisions and never being satisfied because money is not satisfaction, it is not success, 
And I hope they all feel tortured in the mental prisons which came to be through the false vision of success they pushed for their own worldly gain. This is why I included Light Yagami, because he has the workings of an understandable character, someone unsatisfied with the world around him in a common position. He stares out of the classroom window like any protagonist we love. And then he finds the means to provoke change and he works his ass off to see it through. Looking at that notebook full of names is the perfect way to show how much he works. But he grows into a complete maniac who tosses his ideals to the side the second it's convenient. He's smart on paper, but his empire falls due to a thumbnail imprint on a piece of paper, his reliance on others to do his bidding, and his gloating about himself. Light could have stopped at any point and been fine. He had all the resources, all the love, all the power, or he even simply could have begun in a way which didn't make it obvious the killings were related to one person. But he was the most selfish of all of our examples in his goal. By abusing his own positive ideal for gain, he lost the ability to be saved by it. Like every CEO who once put in long nights and now believes they're more worthy than everyone else loses any right to claim their hard work. They found the means to be personally successful, to be personally satisfied like light, able to have anything and everything they could have dreamed, and it wasn't enough. And we have to blame for the system for this too, for teaching them that nothing is ever enough. When it's not enough, it becomes clear that either the ideal was never the real goal, or that the money and power corrupt all and thus the hoarding of both must be disallowed. Hard work alone isn't good. You can work hard towards anything. It must be done in service of something valuable independent of the work. On Shogo Makashima's end, we find an exploration of this. He performs horrible actions in service of his goal, working hard towards something which has the potential to be good but is not inherently so. We discussed at length before the distinction between free will and freedom, so the short version is, we give up the potential to do everything, free will, for the guarantee of most things, freedom. Free will contains many things which are not inherently positive, like theft or murder. However, where Shogo Makajima is positive is in pushing back another concept just like this, advancement. This is something else I've focused on quite heavily recently, so I'll be brief, but Moving forward for its own sake isn't good or bad. Think about getting new equipment at work that makes your job more efficient, but then that just means you simply have to do more in the same shift because of this. There is a motivation behind advancement which drives it, and that is what determines right or wrong. In this example, the motivation is the owner's wallet, not making your job less stressful or less taxing on your body. Makashima admits that after the fall of Sybil, he has no idea what will happen. He doesn't know if society will advance or regress, he just knows free will would be forced to return. After all, should he be seeking out advancement? Blind progress is what allowed his world to be taken over by a false god, what imprisoned thousands and stole from millions, what led him to being so alone. By accepting that a return to the past may be the best option, he recognizes that advancement in itself is not a goal. And it shouldn't be for us either. Blind progress is part of the machine which kills us and our surroundings. We spend so many resources on things like developing new phones each year for minimal benefit because only new is good? And then we buy them each year because settling for an old model isn't really successful? We've been trained to only push forward. When we graduate school, we move on to more school that we then have to pay for, so we go into debt, so then we have to get a good job to pay off that debt, and we have to get a house to have value in retirement because we're always paying off the debt, so then we have to save until we are retired to even be able to do so, and there's always the next advancement which keeps us in the rat race. Success is never actually achieved. This is part of the myth. I think we should be more like these villains, more like Makashima because recognizing this is the first step to killing the myth. We shouldn't adopt his methods, but rather the reasoning behind them. Why have we pushed forward, and should we continue to keep doing so? And there's the Lush's side to our lesson as well. There's a lot of debate about who's smarter between him and Light, and you know what? It's Lelouch, for the simple fact that Lelouch's goal occurs based on the exact principle that Light's loses too. Where the latter truly gives in to that corrupting force of power, the former plays to it. Lelouch's final plan is to become the evil emperor in place of his father, and draw the hate of the world to an even more extreme degree by manipulating even the higher classes and holding the globe hostage under the threat of the most destructive weapons ever known to mankind, 
and then allowing himself to be killed by the symbol of hope he once was. He is an overt parody of success and power, someone abusing it to present its flaws clearly, and at such a high and understandable level it's undeniable even to others who are successful. The world he creates is one united against success, or at least the spoils of it, which will attain peace through an open discussion of how to prevent such a state ever again. How to kill success. The same way that we are made to keep progressing, power will always do the same. Success cannot be gained, it can only be passed from one to another, a gift more so than a reward. Even Lelouch took it from his father at the end of the day. Without the head start, he would have just been another forgotten name. The concept will do nothing but braid itself from itself, a dangerous action of growth in a limited space which chokes out all other life. The rich will get richer, and in times of great trouble, the divide between us and them will grow, exactly what we saw happen in a period of mass death which will leave its scars on entire generations. Lelouch's plan is not just some thriller nonsense, it is a parody of the exact nature of success, it is abusing abuse for something positive. But is this something we can expect? There are good people among the successful, but however well their intent, would anyone be inclined to give up their advantage for another? When they have their children and their families after them, who they justifiably want to succeed as well, can we ever expect them to pass the baton elsewhere? Even me saying all these words, I know that if I was ever rich one day, I'd support my friends too because they're the people I love, the people I would want to succeed as well. The most unrealistic part of Lelouch's story is that he's someone too kind for this world, even with all of his evil. And then there's the elephant in the room. These characters, the ones who chase personal success, they all die, whatever their goals or motivations. And if you're watching this still, you probably know how true that is for our world. Creative souls, kind people, original beings, they all suffer in our world as well. Those working jobs to help their communities are paid less, artists are only hired outside of their fields, people seeking to carve their own path only face resistance. This is all systematic. Does art really contribute less to society to warrant less jobs and lower pay? Or is it just that art focuses less on blind advancement and is rather a direct challenge to established concepts and so is punished and then we have accepted that punishment as normal. I said these villains are more realistic depictions of success than our real world ones, and that includes their suffering. I'm not one for unwarranted optimism. If we become the villains chasing personal success, we will suffer. <laughs> I will take myself as proof of that. We will be punished and mocked and scolded. But in all of these stories, we witness only one such villain. We see a single force struggling against overwhelming might of human history's mistakes. What if they were all together? I think this would even temper these selfish aspects, because all of their abstract goals would fight against the same physical foe. They could each fight for themselves and do a service to the others. Instead of having to be perfect, they could simply be. They wouldn't need to offer up their entire beings to succeed because they'd be able to step down for a moment and recover when needed, and the fight would continue. It should be clear I'm implying this is our path. As villains alone, we will suffer. But maybe as villains together, we could succeed. I've been dancing around the idea for a long time out of fear of being laughed off as some cringy idiot on the internet. But who really cares? I'm here as your villain, and I want you to join me. Let's hate all of this together. This is where this video was supposed to end, but the night before it's going out, I went back and added in those depressing quotes between sections because those are why I made this video, a topic I've really genuinely been struggling with for months. Success being a myth alone in a vacuum means nothing, but the concepts we hold ourselves to and are forced to hold ourselves to by society have large effects on our mental health, which influences our physical health and well-being and the course of our entire lives. Success is the driving factor of my life. Right now, I work a quite structured 70 hours a week between day work needed for survival and my passion here with the channel. 
Work eats up 6 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. when travel time is included because the eight-hour workday is a lie. Preparation for meals and general responsibilities are at least another hour a night, leaving four and a half hours if I sleep a full eight. With one hour of free time, which I spend with family, I often go over until 11 to get in four hours of YouTube work, taking a bit to fall asleep, so that usually averages to six hours of sleep a night. This is Monday through Thursday, Friday is a work day and a night off for stupid card games, and Saturday and Sunday are both 8 hour runs of YouTube work with the nights off, but I usually end up using Sunday night anyway because I'm just sitting at home and this is what I want to do. I know some people will comment about burnout under this video, but this is not burnout from doing the creative things, it's burnout from all the other things life forces me to do. I've been trained to be in a mode of constant production by the concept of success because it meshes with our harsh world's treatment of art to say that creative pursuits are not worthy of success save the most rare cases. If I want success, which I need to live off my passions, then I have to destroy myself for it. My mental state is tied to the numbers of this channel, which I've tried to stop checking recently because when they go down, which they have recently, the amount of time I have to keep pulling 70 hour weeks goes up. A couple months ago, the timeline was two years. With the recent dips, it's looking more like five until it can maybe support me. That's why I haven't celebrated milestones yet since we started really growing. The bits of success that I've seen are absolutely amazing. They're more than I could have ever asked for, and I'm lucky to have even what I do right now. Why should they thank you more than I do for letting me do this to such a wide audience rather than being trapped in my own head with these thoughts like I always was? But no spike in the channel has been enough to rid me of a state of complete overwork as of yet. It's hard to celebrate milestones when the social factors of our world say that none of them are enough success yet. And in chasing this concept which I must do to survive in a way I found valuable, I'm giving up a lot of other things. I haven't played a video game in months, I used to love going through old Pokemon games with one type, but I haven't had time to in so long. I haven't enjoyed media not for the channel except on rare occasions when good friends basically force me to. I speak to my longest friends sparingly each week, and meeting anyone new is stressful because I don't have the time to maintain the relationship. I took one weekend off, and I've been stressed catching up ever since. I go right from working to rushing to get ready for any time out, and then I wake up early the next day to start again when I do have any free time. This is because our world created success, said art was not only successful, and then tied survival to the concept it just made, including, in my country, the literal right to live being tied to it due to non-universal healthcare. How is living not a right? Yeah, I could choose to work less and shoe off day work for something part-time, but a medical emergency would bankrupt me, or the cost of healthcare with less income would do the same. The only success I am supposed to achieve is the basic kind. The simple home, the decent car, and the family I maybe pass some of it on to to do the same. But I don't find value in those things. I don't find value in material goods because I don't fit that mold. My success is not this world's, and I cannot apologize for being who I am in a way that harms no one else and in a way that I cannot help. We could easily let people find personal success and survive, but we choose not to. We make people take a risk, gun for success, and probably maybe die or be so far behind that you never even reach the basic level of success or just accept it and survive. I've tried to split the difference, sacrificing most of the things that make daily life bearable to do both at once because that's the kind of person I am. It's my fault at the end of the day. I could always stop, and after all, I'm the weird one who doesn't fit the mold. But I can't see myself waking up every day to keep destroying the planet by making machines for injecting molding companies just to make enough to survive. Call it corny, but it kills my soul doing that every day and having to just ignore it to push through. And that's the kind of jobs that fit with my degree and provide me with a necessary wage to build a life. That in going to school isn't an option, people will say that, but that's another $50,000 piece of paper, and the success that a $50,000 piece of paper already got me was just the chance to kill the planet quicker. I'm not built to enjoy that. I'm not built for success. It's dangerous because it's meaningless, but we make it mean something. I should be happy with what I have. I should be ecstatic. 50,000 people who want to hear what I have to say, that's incomprehensible to me. That's 
50,000 people. That's, a, that's the stadium I drive past every morning to get to work full of people for me. How is that not successful enough? The trick of success is to make us feel greedy, to make us feel like our passions are not worthy. Yes, I do just talk about anime on the internet, but I can still get comments saying good things. I can still get comments saying I helped someone to be a better person through introspection or that I got them through a rough night with a, either entertainment or just some words of wisdom, that I helped their relationships through what I taught, even that I changed their lives with what I said. I've touched so many people's lives, and I don't even have the time to hold a basic conversation with them right now. That kills me every single day. I've been working seven years to get even just to that point, longer and more dedicated than college or any career I've ever had. It's been more success than I could ever ask for. If I could live off of it, I wouldn't care how slow growth was as long as I stayed afloat. But this world doesn't care either way because those feelings I assist in aren't making someone else all the money. They're only making someone else some of the money. And then I have to look at that and tell myself I'm horrible for not being happy with what I have. I have to feel awful for starting every new interaction with, I'm sorry, I'm very busy, watching my connections wither and die well, new ones hardly start. I had to feel selfish for wanting to explore myself at the same time as chasing a passion. I have to feel selfish for desiring love when I also have goals. I have to wake up and look in the mirror and say, God, you're such a selfish, stupid asshole. Be happy with it, what you have, because some people will never even have this. But I am happy with it. It's just that the world around it isn't. Just that it hurts me. Hurts me enough that in the times of my greatest achievements, I've hit my lowest moments. The night we hit 50k, I celebrated by editing until I only slept 5 hours, which I'm doing again the night before you see this video. All those quotes you saw are from the past 6 months. Just like you, my notes app is my darkest corner, my den of bastardized success. And I guess I don't really have much to say past that. This isn't some grand message past what the main part of the video said. This... It's just a proof of concept. This is just my pain. This is what successful creativity looks like for a perfectly average situation and an anything but average person. This is what success looks like when you don't have the boost that rich assholes have. I'm not asking for personal sympathy. I know plenty of people in worse situations than me, and even if their pain doesn't invalidate mine, I could always at least live the kind of life they don't even have the chance to. I could always at least have the myth of success, that all-important American nightmare. So don't take any time feeling bad for me. If you must take time for me, take it by engaging with my work to celebrate what success should be. Or indulge in the works of your friends and share them around too, even if it's just in personal circles. Tell others about your hobbies and listen to theirs so success of happiness lives on. Hug your friends and your family, your social successes. Play a game you love or read a story that changes you. Go for a walk somewhere and daydream midday. Sleep in late or wake up early and run. Party hard and meet someone new or stay in and talk with someone old. Explore everything from nature to connection to romance and pleasure. Sing and dance to music or play it yourself. Live as you want to live because that is what success really should be. And one day, we'll make sure this world knows it as such. I guess we end it once again on that all-important villainous note to tie this back together as one only vaguely cohesive piece of media on the internet, on the channel, that is the mad ramblings of whoever the hell I am.